continue with our, our final section of the movie, My Son, My Savior. Imagine what it would look like to see your son live, die, and rise. Think about this through the eyes of his mother, Mary. Jesus, behold the Lamb of God. The Lamb of God? Yes. The Messiah. He is the Passover Lamb that God holds. And he will be led like a lamb to his heart.
Caring for John to death. I could only watch as my own son's destiny unfolded, as the prophets foretold.
section of God's word for us to look at and consider, appreciate tonight comes from John chapter 19, beginning in verse 26. Near the cross of Jesus stood his mother, his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother there and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, Dear woman, here is your son. And to the disciple, here is your mother. From that time on, this disciple took her home and took her into his home. Later, knowing that all was now completed, and so that scripture would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I am thirsty. A jar of wine vinegar was there, so they soaked a sponge in it, put the sponge on a stalk of the hyssop plant, and lifted it to Jesus' lips. When he had received the drink, Jesus said, It is finished. With that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. This is God's word. Can you imagine the perspective of a mother sending her son or daughter off to join the, in, join the army and know that they're about to get deployed? Some of you know what that feels like in different ways. Maybe you were the son or daughter who went out into the military, or maybe it's a cousin that you love and you know that, that they're going off across the sea to serve their country. And you'd imagine that that's got to be a worrisome, scary feeling. Knowing that you're sending someone who you love off and maybe they'll go into battle and you're just not sure if you'll get to see them again coming home. Now, when that, when that loved one does come home, when, when they get the break, they get to come and see their family, they have a leave for a short time, and maybe the family members just can't, can't quite believe it's going to happen until a sergeant mom or lieutenant dad comes through the front door and they just get to actually put their arms around them and hold on to them. And all of that fear, all of those worries melt away and they're just replaced with joy because you're here, you've come back to us, you're okay. Fear getting replaced by joy is a repeating theme in the Bible too. A bright light shines in the sky when Jesus is born. And, and shepherds with their sheep are, are there at night and all of a sudden, boom, there's an army of angels above them. And the only appropriate reaction to something like that is really fear and terror. Perhaps just surprise because, because there's angelic beings flying up in the air, but Really, that fear when encountered with one of God's creatures or with God himself ultimately comes from an encounter with the holiness and the perfection and the glory of God. And those shepherds, just like each of us would, saw their own sins so clearly in contrast with that brightness. But soon, when the words came out from the angels of the Lord, that fear, too, was replaced by joy. <laughs> fear not. Never be afraid again. I have good news of great joy for you and all the people, because today, born this night, a Savior has come to take away your sins. And they rejoiced. At Christmas, Mary gave birth to that child. And you wonder how much she knew, how much she understood. How she would be sending this child, this young man, off to battle. He would be going off to battle and would he come back? Would he return? not going uh, overseas to battle a political enemy, 
But through the eyes of faith and the message of the scriptures, we know what the battle would be like. Mary saw her son live uh, through this battle in an entirely different way than any other person on earth has ever lived. Never talking back to his mother or father, always obedient, always quick to answer. You never had to tell him twice, um, being the perfect Son, never curses or anger coming out of his mouth, uh, never being the one uh, to break relationships because of sin. This son entered a battle with his entire life, living a, a holy and perfect life was the first step of the battle so that he could live as a human under God's law perfectly. The prophecy said that, that we read responsively that he was innocent. He had done no violence. No deceit was found in his mouth. Yet he would suffer in this battle. But he would suffer so that he could set us free. Even that suffering wasn't supposed to be his own suffering. We saw from the prophecy from Isaiah, Isaiah, surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering. We all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity, the sin of us all. Look at the cross through the eyes of Mary. Look at how she would have seen and known this was an innocent person on the cross. He shouldn't be there. This is not how this should end for him. Even in his death, Jesus would be there providing for his mother, making sure that, that she was taken care of, the perfect son, the perfect savior. And then she would watch him suffer. And she would watch him suffer the agony of hell as he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But knowing that all was completed, Jesus said on the cross, it is finished. It's all paid in full. All the sin has been paid for. Everything that I came here to do, I've done. And then did you catch the very last words in our reading from the book of John? Jesus, had said, Jesus said, it is finished. And with that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Roman soldiers had nailed him to the cross. Our sins put him on the cross. His love for us held him on the cross, but it wasn't a Roman soldier who killed Jesus. He gave up his spirit. Jesus is in control all the time. He's exactly where he wants to be, and when it looks like he's lost the battle, wait three days. <laughs> wait three days because he's won. Live Die and rise. Can you imagine being the son or the daughter, the husband or the wife, the family member who gets terrible news that their loved one who went off to serve their country, that something happened, there, there, was, there was an explosion, there was a battle, And we're not sure if your loved one has made it. And you get that news and it seems so final. What's next? That's what Mary had. Her, her son had been sent out into battle. She had seen that he had really physically died. But then can you imagine just a few days later... That when, when your grief is dark and your despair seems like there is no way out, all of a sudden there's a knock on the door. And it had all been a mistake and your loved one is there and they've made it back. 
And you'd look at them and you just would not be able to believe it out of joy and out of amazement. Uh, but maybe sometime in that embrace when you've been able to hold on to them again and feel and touch and see that they're really okay and they're really back, the fear and the doubt melts away and it's replaced with joy because they're alive. I can't even imagine how that must have felt for Mary, who really saw her son die. For the disciples, who really saw their leader, the one who they believed was true God, die. But he came back because that's what the prophecy had always been. That's what God had always come to do, to die for the sins of the world and to rise and leave every one of those sins in the grave. And he physically really walked out of the tomb. He died. He, he, he lived and he lives forever now. Jesus was sent into battle by his father so that he could make each of you his brothers and sisters. <laughs> Connected to his father by grace and through forgiveness. We are blessed to call him our Savior. Amen.